This session is more about how are you going to move from where you are currently to where you might want to be in the future, those career goals, those those sectors and job roles that you've been discovering and that you might be interested in. How can you take action to enhance those key skills that those employers want? And so that's going to be the focus of today and signposting a lot of different resources and opportunities for development, both practical and online, just so you have lots of things ready there to see what might take your interest so you can do that. We're going to share the slides after the session. It will be on Career Connect where you booked. So all of that information will be online for you to follow the links. We'll also be putting a lot of the links in the Q&A announcements function as well throughout the session. So do keep an eye on there for the links that we're providing so you can follow them up later. So today is going to be quite fast paced and quick. We're going to go through lots of different options that you can use for your career development to get you where you want to be for your career transition. But first of all, I'll introduce myself. So I'm Chris Jeffs. I'm one of the careers advisors for researchers at the Oxford Career Service, and I'm joined today by my colleague Susie. If you'd like to introduce yourself. Thank you, Chris. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining this session. My name is Susie Salinas and I'm the researcher development consultant at the Researcher Hub and will be co-delivering this session along with Chris. So great to be here. Brilliant. Thank you, Susie. And the good thing is, if you haven't engaged with the Researcher Hub already, they're an amazing organization that works very closely with the Career Service, and they are all about improving that researcher culture and researcher career development support through many different ways. So please do visit the Researcher Hub page at Oxford because they're here to help you. But into the guts of the session. What's this workshop going to cover? Now, I've mentioned it a little bit already but we're going to focus on a career action planning framework as a way of achieving career transitions. Now, many of you may encounter these kind of things in, in performance reviews or in your uh, professional development reviews and things like this, but we're going to give you a simple template that we're going to provide a link to that you can use to articulate your goals for where you want to be and the skills that you're trying to gain when you're getting there. We'll talk a bit about the skills that employers actually want, those employability skills, as well as the technical skills that you already have to unlock those transitions. And we're going to signpost a hell of a lot of stuff that you can do to gain those skills across the university and externally as well. And finally, we're just going to talk a little bit about how you can put those things into step, uh, into action and some ways you can use those next steps and everything you've seen to move forward. But let's get into it. There's a lot to cover in the next 55 minutes or so. So what are employability skills? What do employers want from you? Um, and in addition to your technical knowledge and your technical skills that you've gained during your research. Now, this report from the Future of Jobs survey is the World Economic Forum. It looked across employers, across all sectors and surveyed them to say, where do you see the key skills that you'll need outside of academia employers? This is in 2025. What are the key skills you think will be the most important ones for individuals to have to be employable across sectors? And the good thing is many of these top skills are things that researchers already have through their time as PhD students, as research assistants, as postdocs. These are your bread and butter. This is what you use every day, typically. Analytical thinking and innovation, problem solving, critical thinking, creativity and in initiative, even leadership and uh, reasoning and problem solving. These are all things that are really common for researchers to exhibit. We may not use the language of this yet, but we'll be able to show that these are definitely skills that you are using on a daily basis. The good news is as well that VTI, who are an organisation for supporting the career development of researchers, they did a report into researchers leaving academia and moving outside of it into many different sectors and asked them what the top six skills are that they think are the most important in their current role. 
And as you can see, many of these things, again, it overlaps with those skills that employers want. Communication, critical thinking, problem solving, team working, project management. These are things that you do already. And this is the vast majority of skills that they're saying are the key, most important ones in their roles outside of academia. So you already have those skills. It's about articulating them in your applications and enhancing them perhaps for relevance in the sector that you're moving to. And that's what we're going to talk about today, is that developing those extra skills um, that you may want to enhance. Specifically, employability skills are what are termed for and used by many, many different employers. The uh, Confederation of British Industry, the CBI, their report, Future Fit, highlights eight key skills that employers are wanting. Many of these might look familiar. You'll see them in many job descriptions, communication, planning and organization, leadership, creativity. But there may be some there that aren't as familiar, perhaps like commercial and business awareness. So your ability to understand what is going on in those sectors that you're applying for. But these are the key eight employability skills that we're going to focus on for the rest of today. And you can develop alongside your technical skills as well. And I know Susie, you're just going to give us a bit of an overview and a bit more detail of what those employability skills are. Yes, thank you, Chris. So as you can see here on the screen, um, and as Chris mentioned, you probably are already practicing these skills or honing these skills in what you are doing. But just to give a quick overview of each of these employability skills, I want to highlight the, the two that we see first on the screen here. So communication, whether that is written or verbal. So um, this might be writing in a variety of different styles um, and for different purposes and adapting the format and content to your audience, but also not just only written communication, but also verbal communication and how you are um, speaking in an engaging way, um, whether you are practicing, you know, active listening or whether you have those skills to be able to communicate, whether that's in your research or in a presentation. So this is this is one of the main, main or mo most common employability skills. And then also uh, we have leadership, which uh, leadership can come in many different ways. And a lot of the times we might already be practicing this skill or being a leader in our environment, whether it's, uh, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that we need to have a leader in our title or in our position, but it's about influencing and how we are motivating others in our uh, context and in our community. And so just wanted to highlight this this quick too, but we also see the skill of planning and, organiz and organizing, which relates as well to project management, as Chris previously mentioned, and creativity as well. So thinking about how we can be creative with the different challenges that we um, face in our, in our everyday uh, work. So if we move to the next slide. Um, we'll continue to highlight just another two. So commercial and business awareness, which is about understanding the wider environment in which an organization works and seeing ways to improve efficiency that might result in time and cost savings. But also another a very common skill here is around teamwork. So seeing how we are contributing to discussions, how we are not just working within a group, but actually creating the space and environment for that teamwork to happen, which, as we know, will lead to more productive results. And then the final two skills are around problem solving and self-management. Um, so over to you, Chris, uh, to share a bit about the, the job descriptions. Brilliant. Thank you, Susie. Um, so yeah, as we've mentioned, those eight employability skills will be a really key thing to think of throughout the rest of this um, session. We'll be giving many opportunities for how you can develop them, but do tick down which skills you think you'd like to develop in more and more detail and which of those opportunities might be able to help you do that. But this slide is mainly just to highlight that you'll see those eight core skills popping up again and again in the majority of job descriptions that you see. The language and the terms and the phrasings might not be exactly the same, but in essence, they're there. And the best way to, to see that and see what you might want to develop 
is start thinking about those job roles that you're looking for and download those job descriptions and have a look at those skills and knowledge and responsibilities tables that you can see. This is an example of one I picked off the internet just yesterday and it's for a careers advisor position because I thought it was relevant, but you can see that in addition to that specialist knowledge about awareness of the labour market and dealing with people for one to ones and things like this, those key employability skills come up again and again. High level organisational and prioritisation skills, ability to network and build relations. So that's that communication skills where it's verbal and teamwork skills, the ability to research and use analytical skills. And so you can see again and again, those key employability skills are coming up. So I'd say have a look at those job descriptions, see which ones are coming up for the jobs you're, in, uh, you're, you're uh, attracted to. And then you can use that to start putting your action plan in place for how you might develop in the future. As well as those key eight employability skills, I just wanted to highlight the VTI Research and Development Framework. It's a bit of a dense document, but it is really useful if you struggle to translate your research experience and skills into the language that employers would want or if you're thinking, do I have any of these skills to start with? The answer is invariably yes, you do have these skills, but we'll drop a link in the chat box later or the link is available on these slides once we upload them to Career Connect. But it helps you through the various domains that it sets out, like knowledge and intellectual abilities, personal effectiveness, engagement, influence and impact. It helps you work through their system to identify examples and ways that you have shown those different uh, technical skills that you have, but it also goes into those employability skills. For example, working with others, team working, people management, supervision, mentoring, all of these skills that you will need. So it's an amazing framework that can help you identify examples of how you're exhibiting these skills. And we'll share the link afterwards as well. The main framework we'd like to share today is that career planning framework. So thinking about where you are right now, but what do you want to do? Where do you want to be? And therefore, what skills might you have to develop or enhance on your journey there? There's a nice framework model that's from jobs.ac.uk, which you may have used for looking for academic positions. And this is an amazing um, framework that they've got for career planning on their website. Um, it really shows what the process of that career action planning is. It's reflecting of where you are now. So what isn't working for you? What skills do you have right now? And then it goes on to where you want to be. What is the job that you're looking for? What are the skills that you want to use in that job? And what are the ones perhaps you need to spend a bit more time developing and enhancing so you feel confident and you feel competitive for that next role? It then puts in a series of steps for you to get there. What actions are you going to take? What step by step methods and what opportunities are you going to take advantage of to enhance those skills? And in fact, get yourself to applying and um, acquiring that job that you're looking for in a career transition. So understanding yourself in previous trainings, in workshops in this conference, and there will be workshops specifically on this available from the Career Service in future. It's about understanding yourself and your history, your motivations and your strengths. Understanding where you are right now and where you want to be can be researching those job roles. And again, there's been trainings on this during the conference and there will be definitely next term as well. Or you can speak to a careers advisor to explore these issues that we're mentioning. But what we're looking at is that taking action, that understanding the experience requirements of the roles that you're going for, evaluating your skill level and experience level in them and setting goals to develop and reach that goal that you're going to. The five minute career action plan is a really useful way to get started on that. I think it's the most simple way if you haven't done a career action plan before, it's the most simple template that you can do and I'll show you just in a minute. But in effect, it is that series of steps you're taking to achieve your goals. And it also really valuably takes into account that situations can change. It's a flexible living document. Something might change where you change particularly what role you're going for or a different opportunity has come up or you've managed to move somewhere or, or life circumstances change. You can constantly update it 
so it isn't out of date and you're always pursuing the right development goals for you to get you where you want to be. What we're going to do is think about this kind of template. Many of you may have seen this in a performance review or, or, or things that are similar to this, but setting goals that you can do to get where you want to be. For example, this example was for someone starting their career transition and they don't quite know exactly where they're wanting to go. So what will they do? They're going to undertake an online research to identify a local career consultant. Thankfully, you've got the career service here, so you maybe book in an appointment with a career service, um, a careers advisor. And you're going to do that by a specific time and date. The point of the action plan is it puts specific dates that you can um, put in for these goals or the actions you're going to do so they're achievable and that it is basically a to-do list for you over time that gradually step by step takes you towards your goal. In this instance, those five steps that they list have brought them closer and closer and closer to actually identifying and knowing what their career goal is. But for yourself and your action plan, it might be you already know you want to be a consultant, an actual consultant in business or, or wherever it may be, and you're trying to work through steps to gain that consulting experience to get you successfully on that career transition. Luckily, and we're going to share the link to that career action plan in the chat, and it is available by the link on these slides that you can access from Career Connect as well. But it's a really good tool to use. But thankfully, there is another tool that we advise that is a web based app from the career service, and it's called Career Weaver. Some of you may have used it already. Um, you can get uh, automatic access as a DFIL and you can request access that will be granted as a research staff member. And it's a bunch of five to 10 minute, 15 minute at most activities that you can work through to help you assess your where you are now, your, your motivations, your strengths and values. But they've got really useful tools in there for auditing your skills. Again, you can see those eight key employability skills that we've mentioned before, and it breaks them down where into sub skills that you can use. Examples that could be, um, and for example, active listening was in fact a skill on the job description for a careers advisor position. So many of these you can look at. It will give you the language and the skill language you might need for your roles beyond academia, and it'll allow you to start adding examples to evidence those, to show and help yourself evaluate, where am I on evidencing this? If you have a job description for a specific role you're going for, and you've identified the specific skills that they're looking for, that can also help you guide you to concentrate on those particular skills within Career Weaver that may be more useful for your time to, to, to evidence your examples for. But finally, it shows a smart development goal, a personal development goal at the end. And this is the key thing in action planning is you've evaluated where you are, you've built up your body of evidence, of what you can do with a certain skill, but you may need to evidence it in a certain new context, or you'd like to strengthen the examples that you already have to make them more relevant to where you're going. And those smart development goals are really important part of the um, career planning process. I won't share all of the definitions of them, but in essence, they highlight exactly what you will do. It sets a specific time frame for when you're going to do it, and it sets a clear outcome for what you're going to achieve for doing it. And apologies for those who have already set SMART goals before, but thinking of it in terms of a career transition framework can be that new way of going about it because you're setting yourself clear targets to get yourself from your current situation to that career transition. And so it can be quite a transformative way to look at your career transition plan. As a bit of an example, so your aim is to achieve that career transition into consulting and your SMART goal might be, I'll contact Oxford Consulting Services, which we'll hear about later, um, by a certain date, and that will help me establish the feasibility of me gaining experience in consulting by a certain date where I want to have my career transition achieved. So it really does help you identify specific goals and specific timelines to get you to your end point where you want to be. So I do encourage you through today, and if you download that career transition template, 
to articulate a few of those SMART goals and always make them feasible and realistic and in uh, the time set uh, timelines that are relevant to you. For example, perhaps your contract length has a certain duration and that can set some natural endpoints to your goals. Perhaps your projects and lab work or field work or thesis submission dates can help dictate some of those as well. So you can plan your time and your goals more effectively. Now, I've just passed over to Susie because one thing we commonly hear is I don't have the time or the permission to do this kind of work. But Susie's going to tell us a bit more about how you do have this permission to do these uh, this kind of development. Thank you, Chris. So as Chris mentioned, what we wanted to highlight here was to share that there's um, there's a national agenda that's looking at supporting career development of researchers. So you might be already familiar with the Concordat to support the career development of researchers, but as a quick um, background to this, uh, the university signed the Concordat back in April 2021. And from there, uh, the university was tasked in developing an action plan to say, OK, how are we actually going to fulfill these commitments that we have to support researchers in their career? And so that's how the uh, Concordat action plan was born, which you can see here on the screen and has these three overarching goals that are all about improving Facilitating the, facilitating the improvement of researcher culture, but also supporting uh, researchers and research staff to achieve a range of different career goals, which one of them might be transitioning um, beyond academia. But as you know, there are many different uh, career goals and aspirations that we might have. And so um, if you haven't, or if this is the first time that you're hearing about this, I will also, the link is here in the slide, but I will also share it in a, in a few minutes so that you can take a look at specifically what, what's within the Concordat and specifically what we're doing here at Oxford across the different divisions and teams to help fulfill those commitments. So if we move to the next slide, specifically talking about uh, professional and career development, which what is what we're discussing here. We wanted to share and highlight that from the Concordat, you, um, the, there's this expectation for you to, to take ownership of your career and identify many different opportunities that you can do to work towards those goals, whatever those may be. And to do that, you have um, you have the entitlement to engage in a minimum of 10 days of professional de development pro rata per year. Um, so you may wish to take the 10 days or less, but it's about cr having that space um, for researchers to actually engage in professional development opportunities, which might look different uh, depending on what your goals are and also depending on the different ways that uh, we learn and the different experiences that we can take, which we'll go over in a few in a few minutes down the session. But we wanted to highlight this and also, for example, as you can see here on the screen, um, there's things like engaging in career development reviews with your managers um, or other colleagues. So again, making sure you are um, thinking about your career, planning for your career, and also engaging with others to see how you can uh, get there, take action and get there. Uh, so I believe I'm going to now hand it back over to Chris. Yeah, thank you, Susie. And so this is just to say those entitlements are for research staff. But as DPhil um, researchers, you have your own development entitlements as well. This is just an example. If you're part of a doctoral training partnership or a doctoral training centre, the first place to look is on your um, your partnership or centre website, and there will be typically a section there about career development and your opportunities. You will see entitlements perhaps in your offer letter or if you contact your administrator for the um, PhD that you're on about allowances for funding that you may have for training. Many of them do have training budgets per student. You can also apply for exceptional funding. You will often have maybe placements or um, internship uh, opportunities in terms of time that you're allowed to spend out of your, your PhD. If you're not through one of these centres, 
do look at your offer letter, talk to your supervisor, talk to your administrator in your department and find out exactly what your um, offers and supports and uh, your funding might be for that, because that can open up the opportunities for you. And also there's a link that we're going to include on the slides, which is about permitted work hours for um, uh, doctoral students, both how much you're expected to do as a student on your project. It is a job you shouldn't have to do more that is unhealthy for your for your role, but also the permitted working conditions for you to take side work and volunteering and things like that alongside your PhD. So it's really good to understand, just like the research and development concorder, what your allowances and your entitlements and perhaps your support is as well. So do look at your rights that you have, your entitlements, sorry, for what you might be able to do. But now we're going to move on to where you actually find these development opportunities. And Susie, you're going to walk us through the sort of the methods in which you can develop. Yes, thank you, Chris. So as we all might be familiar, uh, Oxford has many different opportunities that we can take advantage of. Um, but that might be hard to maybe find them uh, or find the correct one for you. But when we're thinking about how, where can we find these opportunities, we also want to think about, OK, how do we actually learn and what's the best use of my time? And so research shows that typically the most uh, the learning for adults mostly happens 70% on the job, 20% uh, by peer learning or interacting with others, and 10% with formal training. And so when we think about development, maybe some of us uh, immediately think about maybe taking a certification or a workshop or a course. But what we wanted to highlight is that there's all of these other options that you can also consider that will help you to develop those skills and feel more confident with them as well. And so um, so if we go to the next one, Chris, I don't know if we're going to have. Thank you. So here are just some examples of what this actually means. So for example, on the job experience might be um, being part of a secondment or having uh, action learning sets, doing maybe shadowing and trying to find opportunities where you can have uh, more experience of doing and, and actually developing your skills through that. On the 20%, we see things like coaching, mentoring, feedback. So enabling those uh, communities of practice or networks um, that you might already have to see how you can continue to maybe work through a challenge that you're currently facing and so forth. And like I mentioned before, formal training are workshops, webinars and e-learnings. And so now we're, we want to share with you um, some examples and, and signpost to you um, from each of these three ways that we learn what you can take action on and, and what might be of interest to you. So um, if we move to the next one, so uh, as you might know and as you're experiencing this week with the careers conference, uh, there are many workshops and sessions that are being held every term by the career service. So we really encourage you to make sure you take a look at these. Um, they might vary from things like career planning to different uh, ways of, of trying to identify, you know, what is the next career step for you? Um, or as we see here, what can a research scientist do for a career if not academia? So there are many different workshops and events that you can take a look at uh, from the career service. And if we move to, to the next one, uh, please. Uh, we also wanted to highlight that um, to really encourage you to take a look at all the training that is offered by your division. So we really want to encourage you to, to have this as a first step when looking at uh, training courses or workshops. There are many different workshops held every year by uh, your division and there might also be some training that's offered in a different division that you're not a part of, but that is actually available uh, across the university. So for example, um, there will be a leadership in action workshop in June um, that is 
<clears throat> organized by MPLS, but it's open to all research staff and all researchers to participate. Um, so if we move to the next one, so this is just an example of what uh, the websites might look like. Uh, and again, training topics might vary from career development to, to more specific disciplinary topics. Um, and another uh, place where you can find more uh, workshops or webinars are from the people and organizational development team. So um, there are many, many different things that, that this team offers, and I'll share the link in the chat in a minute. But if we move to the next slide, Chris, I would just like to highlight a program that is currently running. Uh, that is about uh, people management excellence, and it's open to managers all across the university at whatever level that might be. And you don't necessarily have to have the title and your job role as manager, but you do need to have in some way or another people responsibilities within your team. And so this program uh, is made of different master classes, social learning spaces, uh, which which are action learning sets, which is what I, I mentioned previously, and many, many other materials that uh, might be helpful for you as you continue your journey as a manager. And there are two streams. One is geared more towards new managers, and the other one is for those that might have more years um, as, a, as a manager, uh, and have a bit more experience and are really looking to unlock the potential for their teams. And so you can uh, definitely take a look and express your interest. The program is currently at capacity for this academic year, but plans are underway for next year as well. So please um, do sign up if you think this might be something that is relevant for you. Typically what we hear is, uh, you know, sometimes people tend to be in a managerial position, but haven't had really any formal training. And what's great about this program is that it's from people across the university, so you can also network and connect and start having a support um, network for the challenges that you're facing. So if we move to the next uh, one, Chris, please. Uh, and I believe this is uh, now over back to you. Thank you. Um, one thing that we commonly hear that is quite a frustration for researchers and DFILs is the lack of teaching opportunities here at Oxford. It can seem occasionally a, a quite an unfair process and who you know and stumbling across the right um, set of circumstances that are able to enable that. But the Department of Continuing Education does a set of courses that you might be able to look at um, for helping you at least get the qualifications or the bits of paper that can help evidence your ability for doing this and they help you organise opportunities to deliver that. Your divisions may also have specific courses um, where you'd be able to, to, to look at this as well. And we're going to share some um, opportunities in the next section of the talk about how external organisations can give you module design and active teaching activities as well. And this is quite good to hide that the Department for Continuing Education is a great source of courses across sectors and disciplines and it's embedded into the university as well. You can also look at those external providers as well. If you're a part of a learned society or a professional body, this is an amazing source of training to get you into different sectors that you may want to, to go to. They can often have training support budgets or even free training and networking events if you're part of a particular special interest group or even a committee. You can also look at the formal training companies if you have a budget for going for this, but e-learning providers are actually kind of an untapped resource for doing specialist skills, whether it be coding, where this one's on career management and career transition planning, but there are very specific courses on there for quite a low cost or even free sometimes if they're done through universities to actually help you develop specific skills that can help you transition. So it is worth looking up those e-learning routes and it's a really common thing to see on CVs, especially for people that are considering transitioning and are doing this in their spare time um, for to be able to just evidence the skills that they have. Now, the next session, we're going to whiz through this one because it is um, stuff that you've probably heard before, but it's just a reminder that interactions and using your network 
and being part of communities is a great way to develop that understanding and skills for it. So we're going to focus more on these, some of the active learning in the next session, but just as a briefing, do consider your extensive network. Do think more widely where your community is. Who do you know, friends of friends, past colleagues, lab uh, managers that have moved on, uh, former students that move into different um, different uh, sectors, people you used to work with as postdocs that move into different things. Who is working where you might be interested in working in? How can they give you some insight through networking and talking to them about what you where you'd like to go? and what skills you might need to develop. And they may even be able to set up informal uh, skill sharing with you. And that does happen quite frequently. If you have someone doing a certain skill you'd like to learn, utilize that. And they might be able to even arrange lab visits or even short placements using your development days or your internships. So just think about your network, about if you've got an easy in to an organization or a sector or a skill that you'd like to develop. It's an under tapped, um, underutilized source of easy development that you might be able to use. Doesn't always work, but it's a great place to start thinking about. If you think about what skills you want to develop and who you might reach out to, you go on to research careers.org as well. It was set up with funding for Oxford Career Service, um, but separately administrated by DPhils and uh, postdocs, and it's now expanded beyond Oxford as well, where they profile past researchers who have PhDs or they've done postdocs who have moved beyond academia and it lists their career routes and what skills they have and they're often very happy for you to reach out and connect with them and learn about their transitions and see if there's any opportunities for you to follow um, as well. So do use that profiles and early career blogs and uh, academic lever profiles that you see in accounts that you can uh, tap into. Similarly, you can use the alumni function if you go on the University of Oxford web page on a uh, sorry page account on LinkedIn, you go on the alumni function. It gives you access to the almost 300,000 alumni who have said they've either studied or worked at the University of Oxford. You can then search key job titles or organizations um, or companies that you want to, to work for or you might want to develop or job title like data science or whatever it may be. And it will bring up all the alumni that have been to Oxford and have, are doing or working at those organizations. And it can make an easy common connection for you then to be able to reach out cold to them and say, I also went here. I'm interested in where you work. It would be great to have a chat with you. And that can start some opportunities. Um, so it's a great way for networking. Of course, on Thursday this week at two till four, there is the careers fair for researchers. So come and down and engage with uh, those employers and get some direct insights into what skills they're looking for. That's one of the most common questions uh, that people can ask those employers. They're the ones that recruit you and they're the ones who have done those transitions commonly as well. So ask them about their journey, ask them about what they're looking for, and it can really help you set those goals for your career development planning. It can also mean that you can send out those prospective emails and approaches about are there jobs available or you'd like to come visit them. You can also set up follow up interviews to learn more about those sectors, but it's just a great way to learn about what they want and even open up some opportunities for gaining those skills using your internships or development days or site visits. Just pass over to Susie, who's got a great opportunity for, for mentoring as well for research staff in particular. Thank you, Chris. So just wanted to share with you this great resource from POD or the People and Organizational Development team. Uh, so if you're interested in either becoming a mentor or being a mentee and ask and engaging with a mentor, um, there's this great e-learning re e resource called Mentoring for Development where it's designed to provide an introduction to those core uh, principles for mentoring so that you can uh, become a mentor or a mentee or if you're interested in setting up a mentoring scheme locally. And so we really encourage you to, to take a look at this. I will also mention um, that from POD, you know, we have the, the mentoring resources, but also a coaching network, um, which I don't know, Chris, if it's in the, the next slide or not. I'm going to mention it at the, the end of it. So don't worry, it will be ah, at the, okay. towards the end. 
Perfect. Mm. So I'll just quickly mention it then. We also have a, a, a great coaching network that is available for uh, research, uh, for, for university staff and for research staff, where you get up to four, four to six free sessions with a coach and they typically uh, have a researcher background. So, you know, just to say again, talking about these opportunities for development that are more about uh, that peer learning and, and social interaction, mentoring and coaching are some really good ones to, to think about. Thank you. Cheers, Susie. And oh yeah, this is yours as well, isn't it? Yes, career interest thank plans. you. Yes, yeah, so uh, in addition to that, we are we are piloting um, career interest net networks, uh, specifically around consultancy, entrepreneurship, or if you're interested in research related roles in higher education, which I also know that tomorrow morning at the careers conference, there will be a session um, about this third one in particular. Uh, so if you're interested in joining one of these networks, please do reach out um, and the link for the expression of interest will be shared with you through the slides here. Uh, joining a network, as it's mentioned here, will help you uh, gain some hands on experience and learn more, more about uh, about that certain field that we that we are proposing here around either consultancy or entrepreneurship and really provide a network to meet um, researchers who might have taken a certain path and in general Oxford colleagues who can support you. So if we move to the next one, and apologies to um, for for the the rapid pace, but we also want to to let you know that uh, for both research staff and students, you can book individual one-on-one -on -one appointments with careers advisors who will be happy to meet with you and talk through uh, any of your career challenges or help you think through um, what what might be your, your next step or what those goals that Chris just shared a few moments ago, those smart goals um, that you're thinking about your career. So really encourage you again to uh, utilize this this great resource that we have at the university. So I think it's over over to you, Chris. Thank you, Susie. Yeah, just to say that the careers advisors that you can meet with here as well, of course, they all have their own specializations as well. They've got active lived experience in a range of sectors before they became careers advisors. So they can be a great source of knowledge to either signpost you towards um, sectors that you might be interested in if you're unaware of those at the moment, but actually help you with some specific knowledge as well to get you towards those. So the last section that we're going to look at and in the interest of time we're going to whiz through because today has been about signposting all the various options that are available for you and how you might put those into that career action plan that you're going for. All the slides will be available on Career Connect afterwards for you to follow all of these links as well. So I'd encourage you to just note down anything that takes your fancy that you might think you'd want to pursue further and then investigate that further and book in with a, a careers advisor if you'd like to explore that in more detail. But it's just to say that active learning, getting that hands-on experience is one thing that most people, whether you're a default student or a postdoc um, staff member um, or research assistant, feel they might lack when they're going into industry. But there are tons of ways that you can gain that experience. This is just a summary of them and I'm going to whip through most of them now. But these are things that are actively and are always seen as great ways for unlocking. It's the main way we feel we're developed those skills and experience for unlocking those career transitions. First of all, if you are a DPhil student and apologies to um, research staff, these aren't available for research staff currently, but our internship office you can approach from both micro internships, which take place um, for five day placements. Um, you'll be surprised at how much you get to do and lead and accomplish within such a short placement, and it can be easier to thread through busy periods. But also our summer and winter internship programs, which are for multiple weeks and they have to be paid as well. So they're funded opportunities for you to be able to get direct experience in those. So do look up the Oxford 
internship office and investigate the options for you there. They're woefully underutilized by DFIL students, so do boost the numbers and utilize it. They're all there to help you match to get experience in organizations you might be interested in. There's some information here as well about how you might arrange your own internships through networking, as we mentioned previously, sending out those prospective emails with your CV and your cover letter tailored towards those. And there's some information on our website about how you might be able to do that if those specific organisations aren't available in the partners that we have in the internship office. So do have a look at some of the information there. You may also have funding for your own internships. It's quite common through doctoral training partnerships or doctoral training centres, and you might even be able to look for small sources of funding that can get you small placements during your funding if you can negotiate that with your supervisor for particular time periods that you're going. So all of those sources will be available as well for funding your own project. But other ways of sourcing that active hands-on experience can be through that volunteering and your positions within a community. And that's not just meaning your local community of your geogra geographical location, but also for organisations that you're a member of or committees that you're a part of. There are lots of opportunities for you to be able to do this. And we're going to go through a few of those now, but within the university, you've got consulting, policy engagement, public engagement and knowledge exchange that you can take part of. In your local organisation, such as the Oxford Hub, you have uh, opportunities for outreach and social enterprise to get project management experience, to get experience in a sector that is beyond your current research. You also have your learned societies and professional bodies that you're part of, and you can volunteer in committee positions, in projects that they're running, in special interest groups, and all of these are really valuable um, examples of how you've got experience outside of academia, even if it's within an academic supporting organisation. The role you're taking in that organisation is something that typically isn't research experience. It's more leadership, it's more teamwork, it's more planning. And so all of those things are really valuable for CVs and people do recognise them as skills for when you're transitioning beyond academia. So for consultancy, this is typically leveraging your specialist technical knowledge and research experience into other organisations outside of academia. It's advising and assisting clients to help them solve their own internal challenges. It's not typically where you sit down and you do it yourself, but it can sometimes involve that kind of um, kind of involvement if it's agreed. They can be short term in nature but they can be extended and you're typically paid for your expertise as well. So there was a question in the chat about what do we do if we can't be funded for these kind of placement opportunities? Well, consulting might be a really good first step to get experience in other sectors using your coding skills, your ability to set up a lab, your people management and project management skills, or your understanding of the research landscape and ability to gather evidence and make informed reports. All of these are really important skills that you can leverage for um, other organisations and get paid for it as well. You can do that through Oxford University Innovations Consulting Services. So that's here at the university. You can register as a prospective consultant, list your expertise, and they can help you walk through the process. And even when uh, organisations contact them, we need a medical innovation expert in diabetes technology. They might be able to hook you up with that if your profile is matching. So I do encourage you to register and investigate the consulting services. For students, you can also sign up to the consulting services, but there are projects here that can really help you take an active example of that. The Oxford Strategy Challenge, which is available on our website, is a one week programme where you pair up in an interdisciplinary team of other students and you develop direct real life experience solving a problem for an actual employer. And many people who have taken part in that often do follow up placements or stay engaged or use that as a key example on their skills based uh, CV when they're applying for jobs outside of academia to show that they've got teamwork, they've got commercial, a commercial awareness and they've had involvement in consulting. 
once you've done that small program of five uh, about a week, you can then sign up to the student consultancy, which is basically the same, but it's four to six weeks. And it's a really CV changing project that you can do to show that you've engaged in businesses and charities and you have all of these skills. There can be incredibly transformative activities that you can do. Beyond consulting, you've got volunteering. So the Oxford Hub is just one example of an organisation where some um, volunteering you can do is just an hour a week, teaching English or mentoring or coaching someone. But you can also have bigger, um, bigger uh, involvement, such as the Community Enterprise Awards, where you're actually designing a project that can be implemented around Oxford to genuinely benefit people. You might not know that on Little Clarendon Street, where the Oxford Hub is based, one of their offices, there's the coffee shop next door, which is actually a community enterprise um, and social enterprise um, startup based on one of these awards, I believe. If I've got that wrong, I'm sorry, but I'm pretty sure the, the, the lead of the Oxford Hub told me that that was one of those initiatives. So you can actually see real change and real action through volunteering with the Oxford Hub. So do look up their work. Again, for that teaching and community outreach and public engagement, the Brilliant Brilliant Club is a UK wide organisation that pay researchers to develop modules and deliver them in schools. They're an incredible organisation. They pay us as researchers. That is quite rare to find for these kind of opportunities. So I would look them up and they train you and develop you through the process and link you up with schools. A wonderful organisation. Whilst alongside your research, you can do activities that meet your research aims that are of incredible value for employers outside of academia as well. Public engagement with research, knowledge exchange, policy engagement, all of these activities are organised through the university. You can work with dedicated university support staff who are experts in these areas. And the importance of that is it will directly engage you with other stakeholder groups using modes of activity and delivering impact that employers beyond academia really wish that you, you know, really encourage you to have and really value you having. And you can do it as part of your research. Many grants will have that public engagement or policy engagement or knowledge exchange requirement as part of the funding. And this is a way that you can gain those skills beyond academia but doing it on the job. So two birds, one stone. So it can be a really valuable thing to look up. One last thing we'll mention is being part of that community. So those leadership style positions and, and gaining those leaderships and teamwork and if information and policy uh, implementation kind of work. You can look up your research staff representative or if you're a postgraduate, there are postgraduate representatives as well. They're specific to particular departments, they're specific to uh, particular divisions, and you can actually then feed in to consultations and policy change at the university level. And it's a fantastic opportunity for you to put something again that you can do alongside your research within the university, but is developing so many employability skills that people beyond academia will really value. So I do encourage you to Google the Oxford University research staff representations and our pages are there and we'll put a link as well in um, the slides in the chat afterwards. But finally, that was a whistle stop tour through so much of it. And in our final 10 or well, five, 10 minutes or so, I'm just going to show, uh, share some of the next steps that you can do to turn all of those opportunities in your career plan into action. So I'll just pass over to Susie to walk us through the final few slides. Thank you, Chris. And just a quick question from the chat line. Um, wondering, are these program opportunities only for students? I think it was what you were just sharing right before. The Oxford, if you were meaning the Oxford Strategy Challenge and they are just for students, there was the Researcher Strategy Consultancy project that was running until just this year, sadly, because our funding for that has run out. But if you would like those kind of consulting opportunities for researchers, I encourage you to email us because once we know there's a demand for it, that's when you can start leveraging the need for funding and support for it. So please do contact us with why isn't there a version of this for research stuff? But politely said, because then we can start looking into options to make that reality again. Thank you, Chris. 
Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, sorry, just checking. Can you hear me all right? Yep, I just got you. Just a quick technical glitch here. No, I've got you. I can hear you. Okay, might... thank you. You got me? Thank you. Yes, so um, so moving back here to the next steps. Um, so as you've seen today, there is a lot out there and a lot that you can do. Um, so we will be sharing these slides up in Career Connect after the session. But if we move on to the next slide, and I think, uh, can you hear me, Chris? I think I had my internet go down. Oh, I've got you, but if you can't hear go. me, I might. You can hear me. Okay, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Sorry about that, everyone. Um, so one of the resources that we have that we want to highlight is the researcher's trail map. So as you know, there's a lot of different um, resources out there for you, and sometimes it can be quite difficult to navigate. So we have this great uh, tool that is focused for yourself, uh, your research and your career, and it takes you through the timeline of your contract and giving you specific signposted links um, of resources you can tap into while you are moving further along in your contract. So again, we um, have heard really helpful feedback from this tool, so encourage you to uh, check it out while you are thinking you know, about your next steps. So I think I might pass it back to you, Chris, for the for the closing. Thank you. And so this is it now. And just to, to thank everybody in the audience for for listening to a real smorgasbord and rapid signposting of the opportunities that are available for you. This was the aim of today was really to sort of introduce that career action planning framework and a lot, just to show how many options there are for developing those employability skills and highlighting what those employability skills are that you may want to develop in your remaining time here at Oxford or in your independent time if you're maybe between positions. Please do book in that one-to-one -one with a careers advisor and we can give you that bespoke feedback and signpost you to the direct things that you might be interested in particularly. Um, because of course today was a surface level, but we do encourage you to follow up and come speak to us in more detail. But it's just to reiterate that that career action plan is about constantly taking action, setting yourself goals, seeking those opportunities and taking that development. It's about reviewing it over time and seeing, OK, what goal am I? Where, where is my career destination I'm aiming for? What are the skills I need to do? What are the opportunities that are coming up and setting yourself new goals? But the idea is that by being flexible and making it step by step, small, achievable goals, you'll constantly be feeling that movement and that progression towards where you want to be. A very common issue that we receive as careers advisors is they don't know where to start as researchers seeking a, a transition and they feel they're stagnating and they can't develop skills. This method of career action planning ensures that even if it's only the smallest thing that can mold around your, your life and your other priorities and, and, and things that are in the way of finding time for this, you'll always be trying to find that small, progressive, iterative ways forward. So I do encourage you to come speak to us about that career action plan and try it yourself. That is just to show you again that this is the career action plan template, which we'll share. Um, there'll be a link on the slides and we'll try and share it in the chat as well. And there's always a bit of time you hopefully might be able to find, but starting small is an excellent way to start. Just one or two hours a week, where you can do a small thing to investigate, speak to a person, do some volunteering. Um, can you seek other opportunities in your departments? Can you organise an internship for further down the line or begin some volunteering? But it all starts with identifying a whole range of options that you might be able to pursue. Seeing which ones look realistic for you to be able to achieve in the time constraints that you have and prioritising those ones that you know you'll be able to achieve. And those small steps first are a great way to start and build up that momentum as you're developing those skills. The last thing we mentioned, we just said we have hit 12.15. So Susie, I might pass you over just to um, say how you could use this career planning in your career action plans and your conversations with your PIs as well and your supervisors. 
Thank you, Chris. So I'll um, try to be quick and, and brief, but you know, we've talked a lot about uh, the many different things that you can do to take that one small step that uh, Chris was mentioning. So after you have all of these ideas and are thinking about where you might want to go in your career, we wanted to share this tool uh, that's called Career Conversation Planner that might be helpful for you to, uh, to then uh, prepare a conversation and either have it with your manager or with another uh, colleague to share what your uh, what you're looking for for your career um, and seeing what you can do to get there along with um, your manager. And so we have a lot of resources for career development reviews for researchers um, and the link will be here on the slide. But these are just some of the examples of the questions that are in this career conversation planner and we wanted to share them with you so that you can uh, also use this as a resource to take it forward for you to have these conversations and start taking action um, for your career. So. Um, I believe there's a, another slide, Chris. Yes, so here again are the resources. And as we've said throughout this talk, make sure you take advantage of the availability of the careers advisors at the Career Service. They are um, here for you to have one-on-one -on -one bookings. And here on the slide, you can just see the, the different type of guidance that is available for having these career development reviews for if you're a reviewee or a reviewer or also for departments and faculty administration. So over to you, Chris. Thank you, Susie. And Susie's already mentioned the coaching, but that can be a transformative thing, an opportunity that you can take part of. You can also see us as careers guidance counselors that act in a similar way to get started, but the coaching is really in depth, fully trained, and that will be a great opportunity for you. Just to say, as we close, thank you for your patience as you uh, we've overrun by two minutes. But there is that five minute career action plan on jobs.ac.uk, which is an excellent basis for starting this. It gives you tips for how you approach it, how you make it realistic and how you can build it into your time. It also focuses on how you can assess those realistic uh, goals that you can do next. And just to conclude, our final points are that a career planning approach matches exactly what you want with what your employers want to make sure that you're putting step by step goals in to uh, get the exact skills that you're going to need. Setting those smart goals is exactly what can help you get there step by step. And there are so many opportunities within the university, but also look at those ones outside in your professional bodies and your other networks as well. Seek and prioritize those opportunities that, that you've got. Don't worry about cramming them all into a, a week. See how much time you've got to develop and drip feed them throughout, make them realistic and manageable and keep that momentum of moving forward.